Well, hello everybody and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, another session on Service Catalog, this time on Service Catalog in OpenShift 3.7, something we're very excited about here at Red Hat. Um, we just did a Commons briefing with Paul earlier this week. Um, they gave a great overview and in-depth dive into Service Catalog, what's going on in the Kubernetes SIG, um, and the latest and greatest release, and we'll include the links to that when we post this video up. Um, but right now we want to dive in with Paul and get some hands-on um, demo, hopefully live, um, of Service Catalog in action at on OpenShift. So take it away, Paul. All right, thanks for the introduction, Diane. So today we're going to be focusing on the Service Catalog as it will be present in OpenShift 3.7. Uh, we have several bro service broker implementations that we've been working on at Red Hat. Uh, the two that I'm going to focus on today are the template service broker that uh, uses OpenShift templates to provision services and the Ansible service broker that uses Ansible playbook bundles to provision services. There's also an on mass service broker for messaging as a service, but today, uh, we're going to focus on the template service broker and Ansible service broker. So I'm going to, whoops, did things in the wrong order. That's okay. Oh, there we go. So let's take a look at the OpenShift console. Um, and this is the service catalog in the OpenShift console. This is in OpenShift 3.7 release candidate zero. And you can see we've got all kinds of services in here. We only have two service brokers hooked up to this OpenShift cluster. Uh, one is the Ansible service broker and the other is the OpenShift template service broker. Um, you can see we've got all kinds of services here. We've got a couple different flavors of Jenkins. We've got MediaWiki. Uh, we've got Python. I think Diane likes Python. We've got uh, Rocket Chat. A uh, couple different flavors of Postgres. Nginx, all kinds of stuff. So before I start poking around in the OpenShift console, I want to take a look at the cluster service broker resource, which is how service brokers are registered with the service catalog. So the resource, as I said, is called cluster service brokers. And we can see here we've got the Ansible service broker and the template service broker. Let's take a look at the Ansible service broker. So we can see here the name of this resource is the Ansible service broker. As part of its spec, it has a reference to a secret uh, called Ansible Service Broker Client that lives in the Ansible Service Broker namespace. And this has the bearer token that we're going to use to authenticate from the service catalog controller to the Ansible Service Broker. We've also got a CA bundle here, which contains the certificate authority that we're going to use to verify the Ansible Service Broker's TLS. And then finally, there's the URL for where the service catalog controller should talk to the Ansible service broker. Let's make this font size just a little bigger here. So my, if we look- My eyeballs, thank you for that. All right, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, so if we look at the status, we've got, a uh, ready condition here with status true. And that tells us that the service catalog controller has fetched the catalog entries from this broker and populated them into the cluster service class and cluster service plan resources. So the way that a cluster operator will, uh, will add a new service broker to the service catalog is by creating one of these resources 
one of these cluster service broker resources in the service catalog API server. Now, if you saw the OpenShift Commons gathering earlier this week where I did the service catalog overview, you might remember that the service catalog API server is <clears throat> aggregated with the main OpenShift API server via the Kubernetes API aggregator. So when I'm talking to the service catalog API server and, and doing operations on the command line here against the service catalog resources, I don't have to know anything special about how to talk to that because I'm just talking to it like it's part of OpenShift. So let's take a look back at the console. <clears throat> now, I, I like chatting with people. Rocket Chat's a, a nice service. So if I were to go and provision a Rocket Chat instance, I'd see here a nice description that tells me that it's Rocket Chat backed by a MongoDB, which images it uses. I click Next, and I've got some parameters that I can change. But I'm just going to leave those in the stock configuration. Now, I've actually already provisioned a Rocket Chat instance. So let's take a look at my project. In the project overview, you can see this provision services section is about services that have been provisioned via the service catalog. So let's take a look here. We can say, we can see that it's already ready. It's been provisioned successfully. Which configuration values we sent as part of that provision. And we can see events associated with it. So we can see here at 148, we started provisioning. And then at 149, it was provisioned successfully. Now I'm going to switch back to the command line. And let's take a look at the, at the API resource for this. So we can see there's one service instance resource. It's in my demo project. And its name is DH, Rocket Chat, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look at what the YAML for this looks like. So you can see the instance here is service instance. It's part of the service catalog.cates.io v1 beta 1 API group. And I got to tell everybody that's watching this, when I see that v1 beta 1 on there, it's really satisfying to me. It took quite a bit of work for us in uh, the Kubernetes service catalog SIG and the Open Service Broker API working group and everybody working on this project here at Red Hat uh, across <clears throat> the various uh, engineering teams and Red Hat UXD to get to this point together. So it's really awesome to see that we're at that V1 beta 1 level. That means we'll be able to support service catalog and OpenShift. So looking at the metadata, we can see here's the name, DH Rocket Chat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the namespace is demo project. And then looking at the spec, we can see here that there's this field called cluster service class external name. This has the human readable name of the service in the Open Service Broker API. And then cluster service plan external name, which is the name of the, the plan that we're on. Now, we then have these other fields, cluster service class ref and cluster service plan ref. And those have references to the actual Kubernetes names of the resources for the service and plan. Um, if you saw the commons gathering, gathering on Monday, you might remember that I touched on this a little bit. The reason that the human readable name 
and the Kubernetes names are different, is that in Open Service Broker API, it's possible for a broker to change the name of a plan or a service. However, in Kubernetes, we don't support changing names of resources. And due to time constraints to hit the timelines that the vendors in different organizations working in the Kubernetes service catalog, SIG, wanted to hit to get this uh, software out in front of users at a beta level. What we decided to do initially is to use the open service broker immutable IDs as the Kubernetes names. But as a user, when you work with this, you can still use the human readable names. So in the future, it's very likely that we'll have a naming strategy where the human readable names are the Kubernetes names. But for now, this was a compromise that we had to make in order to, uh, to get this beta release out in a timely manner. So the next thing we're going to look at here is this external ID field. This is the ID of this service instance in the Open Service Broker API. So all of the operations that the controller makes against the service broker that this service comes from are going to be made in terms of this ID. This isn't something that you're going to be exposed to as a user, but since we're drilling into the resource, I thought it would be good to call out. So next piece of information here is the parameters from element. It has a, a reference to a secret key, a key of a Kubernetes secret that has the parameter values that we're going to send or that the service catalog is going to send to the broker during provision. Now, this is really important because being able to reference a secret lets us send sensitive information to the broker without putting it directly into this service instance resource and making that resource an escalating one. So the advantage here is that you can grant uh, view access to this resource to somebody that might not be permissioned to see the sensitive information that you're sending. And since it comes from a secret and doesn't show up directly in the resource, they won't be able to see it. Now there's also, and you may remember this, seeing an example of this, if you watched the Commons Gathering from earlier this week, there's also the ability to put parameters directly into uh, the resource, the service instance resource. You should never do that with sensitive information, but it is uh, another flavor of being able to specify parameters. So last interesting thing in the spec is the user information. We can see my, uh, username down there, good old P. Mori, the groups that I'm in, and some extra information from the uh, OpenShift authorizer. Now, the reason that these are captured in this resource is that we have to be able to send them via the originating I identity uh, part of the provision message to the service broker. And what it lets the service broker do is make checks about whether myself as PMORI should actually be able to provision that rocket chat. So let's take a look at the status. And I'm highlighting things just uh, to make sure that people can see them. But the first condition that we have here, or the first thing we're going to take a look at here is the ready condition. Its status is true. And there's a reason and message on there letting us know that the instance was provisioned successfully. The next thing in the status we're going to look at is this external properties. These are, this is information about what the service broker that offers the service knows about for this service instance. So we've got to check some of the parameters that we sent. And we also have a list of the parameters and their values. Now, because these parameters were uh, sent from a Kubernetes secret, the only value you're going to see for those is redacted. If we had some inline parameters that were part of the instance, you'd be able to see those values there. But since the OpenShift console, being security conscious as we are here at Red Hat, stores parameters exclusively in secrets, 
we're going to just see for this one, this redacted value. And then finally, we've got the user information that the service broker knows about for that we sent it for provision. So this is very useful as a user because it gives you a good idea of exactly what information the service broker has about the service instance. So let's go back to the OpenShift console. And we're back in this provision services view. You'll notice the same uh, configuration parameters here, MongoDB admin password, database name, et cetera, you can see in the OpenShift console. Now I'm going to uh, go back to the services. These are the Kubernetes services. And there's one that that <clears throat> Ansible playbook bundle deployed for our Rocket Chat service. So let's click on this. And we've got a link that we can click here. And there we go, Rocket Chat. So let's go ahead and create an account and I'll prove to you all that this actually works. Oh, oops, I clicked the wrong button. There we go. So here's my name, Paul Service Catalog, Mori. Pmori at redhat.com. Super secure password, 12345. Registered a new account. That's pretty amusing. It puts Service Catalog into my username. Yes, we are definitely going to use that username. And now I'm, I'm in here chatting around with myself. So that's Rocket Chat as provisioned by the Ansible service broker. Let's go ahead and go back here and I'm gonna show a couple more services being provisioned. So we've got, we're back in the view of my project and I'm gonna add a new service. So I'm gonna go up here to add to project and go browse catalog. And I'm gonna choose a Jenkins. So similar to what we saw with the other service, uh, the Rocket Chat service, we've got a description of what this is and some information about it. We've got some parameters that we can set that are gonna be included in the provision request to the broker. Let's go ahead, I, I don't feel the need to change these. So let's go ahead and click next. And now we are on this binding view. Now, if you've seen other commons gatherings or other talks that I've done about service catalog, you'll be familiar with the concept of a binding. But if you haven't, a binding is a way to get via the Open Service Broker API as mediated by the service catalog information about how to use this service. So we're going to say, yeah, let's do a binding. And this is going to give us a secret that contains coordinates and credentials that would allow us to program against this Jenkins instance. All right, so this is being provisioned now. And since we've already looked at this, I am going to uh, cross my fingers and offer uh, my eternal allegiance to the demo gods. And I'm going to try doing something pretty cool. So while that Jenkins is provisioning, I'm going to make a <clears throat> Postgres database. This is another one from the Ansible service broker. And by the way, if I didn't, if I didn't specify before, this Jenkins instance that I'm provisioning comes from the OpenShift template broker. Now, one thing I'll call out is that if, if you were watching this without audio, you would not have any idea. Well, you might have some idea since I showed the Ansible service broker earlier that maybe the Rocket Chat came from the Ansible service broker. But as far as what you would see as a user, you wouldn't have any idea what 
provisioning technology we were using to create these service instances, which I think is really powerful and a central part of the value proposition for the service catalog and open service broker API is that you can just focus on solving your engineering or business need without having to worry about the details of exactly what technologies uh, are being used to fulfill these requests. So let's take a look at this again. We've got a uh, description here. We've got a list of images that we're gonna use. Uh, this service has multiple plans. So we get to choose a plan. We're gonna choose the development plan. And again, there's some parameters that we can set. We're gonna go with good old Post, Postgres 9.5. And just for kicks, we're not going to bind to this one at this time. So let's go ahead. We've created that one already. And we're also going to create a MediaWiki instance. So this view is probably getting familiar for now. Since this one doesn't have multiple plans, we don't have to pick one. We're going right to configuration. And let's go ahead and create it. So let's go back to our demo project. And it looks like our Jenkins was provisioned successfully. So if you remember, we created a binding for this Jenkins instance. Now, on the provision services page for that Jenkins service instance, we can see that there's a, bindings, a binding already for it. We can also see some events. Let's go back to our Kubernetes services and see if we can actually navigate to that Jenkins. Guess my certificates aren't set up quite right, but there we go. We've got a Jenkins instance. I'm gonna log in with OpenShift into that Jenkins that we provision via the OpenShift template broker. We're gonna grant Jenkins permission to access my OpenShift account on this instance. And there we go. Plunked right into a Jenkins. No clue how it got provisioned, except that we've got my uh, audio here letting us know that an OpenShift template actually created this. So that's pretty sweet to me. We've got a good spread so far. Rocket Chat, Jenkins. Let's check on our Postgres service. All right. So this one was provisioned successfully too. And then our media wiki was also successfully provisioned. So let's take a look at that media wiki. Interesting, I think uh, perhaps the demo gods may not be happy with me here. Let's go back into the OpenShift console and take a look around and see if we can figure this out. I think the demo gods are always tempest. Ah, uh, now the deployment for MediaWiki is actually running right now, running right now. Yeah. One of the things that I really love about the OpenShift console is that you can just easily view the logs for all kinds of different things, builds, deployment. Looks like the deployment's running. So maybe I didn't give myself enough time here uh, <laughs> before I started taking a look at it. Paul, one of the other things that I'd, I'd like you to talk about too, if you could, is um, 
is how do you get these service catalogs um, instantiated in an OpenShift too? How do you make OpenShift aware of the different catalogs, if you could? So let me decompose that question into the two different things. Yes. Uh, there's two different aspects. One is how do I get an OpenShift cluster with the service catalog? Yes. And to answer that, there are two different ways. I think probably people are uh, <clears throat> familiar with OC cluster up. If you want to use OC cluster up, all you have to do is say OC cluster up dash dash service catalog. And if I were to hit enter and I didn't already have an OpenShift cluster running, which of course I do, we would see uh, that we'd wind up with an OpenShift cluster and the service catalog installed into it. It's just that easy. Uh, you will get the template broker by default. Um, and in the OpenShift installer in 3.7, when you create a new OpenShift cluster, you'll also get the service catalog installed by default. So the next facet of this question is how do you connect a service broker to the catalog? The answer to that is that a cluster administrator or somebody with the uh, service broker admin role can create a new cluster service broker resource. And those, those look just like we've already shown. Take a look at one again, just to drive the point home. So here's a cluster service broker. They're called, it's called cluster service broker because it's cluster scoped. Um, in the future, it's very likely that we'll have namespaced versions of brokers, service classes, and service plans and allow users to register their own brokers just within their namespace. For now though, uh, just to keep things simple in the first couple iterations of the service catalog, we made service brokers and service classes and service plans cluster scoped, which means they don't live in a namespace. So this is the Ansible broker that, that we're looking at. Uh, the important parts of the spec are, um, where do I talk to it, which is this URL field, and how do I authenticate to it? So the, the two different facets of that, uh, uh, of authentication and security for communicating with the broker are the bearer token that we're going to use to talk to it, which is in the, in this case, it's a secret uh, in the Ansible service broker client uh, secret in the Ansible service broker namespace. And then there's also a CA bundle that, uh, we'll use to verify the broker's TLS. Now, if you have a, <clears throat> if you have a broker that has a root sign certificate um, from a certificate authority, a authority that is already in your trust store, you won't need to specify this. But if you're using uh, <clears throat> a broker that has its own self-signed certificate, you'll need to use the CA bundle to specify that so we can verify the broker's TLS. So the workflow for specifying these things is uh, that a cluster administrator or somebody with the role to give them the permission to create this resource creates a resource. The service catalog controller then uh, gets an event and says, hey, there's a new cluster service broker I'm going to go contact that broker, get its catalog payload, which contains the services and plans that that broker offers, and then transform that into our cluster service class and cluster service plan resource. Does that make sense, Diane? That makes sense to me. Um, I hope it does to everybody listening. Uh, and I think it does. There's no questions. So that's pretty good. And thanks for doing that. Uh, so it, is MediaWiki is, is it deployed yet? There you go. It looks okay. like it. So let's go to services here. We'll try to load up that me media wiki again. Hmm, that's weird. I wonder if there might be some uh, trouble that we're running into. 
we had a little bit of hiccups. Networking things, yes. It's it's kind of it looks a little hung up. Yeah, it sure does. It's been stuck. I love that message. It's stuck. Yeah. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? It's Friday. We're stuck. <laughs> yeah, we're stuck. Um, okay, well, I think we're probably about at time. So yeah, I think what? So. Uh, the one thing I was going to ask, um, is there any documentation on, on the OpenShift site at all for 3.7 that talks about this, or is that still to come? Because it's very early on. I, I, uh, I don't think that we've published the 3.7 docs yet. Yeah. Uh, there is doc for service catalog, the alpha version uh, mm -hmm. that was shipped with the tech preview qualification in OpenShift 3.6. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's been a huge amount of uh, change since we released that initial alpha version. Mm -hmm. So it's something that people can go and look at, but it will be fairly different in terms of the, the actual nitty gritties and the details. So um, advice for people who are uh, thinking about using this, um, it, it is very early days, things will change, um, but we do really want you to um, give us your feedback on it, try it out, let us know where the shortfalls are, what's missing, um, what you love about it, we like to hear good things too. Um, and where can they find out more? Maybe pop back into that slide deck of yours and tell a little bit about the Kubernetes SIG. Whoops. I think that was your I'm very, no. that's okay, your very last one there. Yeah, uh, I do want to say uh, things may change, but they will change additively. Yeah. Since this is now a beta API, we will make all future changes in a way that's backward compatible with what we ship in OpenShift 3.7. So you can try this out with confidence and know that it, it's not gonna change totally out from underneath you. Um, so expect those additive changes with more features and more, uh, more goodness and more flexibility. Uh, but the fundamentals here are pretty much baked at this point. And that's what allowed us to put the beta API level on it. So, if you want to learn more about this, you can uh, you can check out the Open Service Broker API. Uh, there's also a link here to the Service Catalog uh, source repository in the Kubernetes Incubator organization. And like I always do uh, when I do talks like this, I will say uh, that I'd be really happy to have anybody that wanted to make a contribution uh, come and attend a SIG meeting or poke around in the service catalog repository. We're a pretty friendly group, uh, at least we try to be. So I'm very, very interested in having new contributors. And I also want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank again everybody that has contributed to this project so far, whether, whether you've made code changes, whether you've helped figure out requirements, whether you've tried it out and given us some feedback, as we've gotten a lot of feedback, uh, especially since we released the beta with people finding bugs that we've fixed. We've actually, uh, if you notice, this, this slide deck is called o Service Catalog 0.1.0. Well, that was released, I believe, October 23rd. And since then, we've done two additional uh, releases with fixes for issues that people have found. So we're actually on 0.1.2. I released that yesterday in the upstream. Uh, but anyway, I digress. The last resource on here is a link to uh, information about the Kubernetes Service Catalog SIG. Yeah. Uh, I also want to just add in to thank Paul and, and the, everybody else on the SIG for all the work that you guys have been doing. It's a wonderful uh, cross-community collaboration. It's been a conversation that I know it feels like it's been a lot of you know, work and taking a long time, but actually relatively quick time to go from um, talking about getting the service broker working to actually having this beta um, available in 3.7. You know, in terms of internet time, um, it, to go from having conversations with OpenShift customers and end users who wanted this stuff to actually 
collaborating with the folks from Cloud Foundry to get Open Service Broker um, forked off into its own repo and get it. So this has happened really relatively fast. And um, it's a, a testament to the openness and transparency and, and all of the goodwill um, across all these different communities that have um, really made this happen. And, um, and just, you know, Paul, I know it's the end of the year and there's lots going on, but this has really been, you know, a wonderful um, example of good open source collaboration. So um, kudos to you and your team. Thanks a lot, Diane. That means a lot coming from you. And I just have one more thank you to put out there uh, is I want to thank everybody from Red Hat. Uh, we've had so many different teams. I want to say at one point we had six teams uh, within Red Hat working on uh, the stuff that you have seen today. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for their collaboration, openness, and uh, uh, teamwork on this effort. Uh, Thank you, everybody from OpenShift uh, Developer Experience, OpenShift UI, Red Hat UXD, uh, the OpenShift Ansible Service Broker team. Uh, it's all been fantastic. Thank you a lot, everybody. And thanks, everybody, for watching today. Take care, all.